Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Dementia and Modern Legal Practice. In today's webinar, Dr. Farah will discuss the definition of dementia, mild cognitive impairment and types of treatment, prevention, medical and legal risks, and insights and future implications. To give you a little background about our presenter, Dr. Brian Andrew Farah, he is a board certified practicing psychiatrist and a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. He is the medical director and chief of psychiatry at High Point Division of UNC Healthcare. Dr. Farah is also an assistant clinical faculty member of High Point University, Division of PA Studies, and is nationally known researcher, educator, and clinician. He is an experience in deposition and courtroom settings. His latest book, Hemingway, Hemingway's Brain, is due out in 2017 by the University of South Carolina Press. Attendees who require a passcode, the word for today is MIND. During the Q&A session, we will ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete this survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with a link to the archive recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list to the left of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Dr. Fair, the presentation is now turned over to you. Great. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. And um, uh, for those of you who joined us last week on our talk on chemical dependency and substance abuse, welcome back. And if this is your first uh, webinar, welcome to you, too. So uh, this is an area that we see very, very commonly, of course, in clinical practice and hospital-based practice. And just uh, anywhere you are in medicine, you're going to see uh, individuals with dementia. You may admit someone for a surgery only to find out they may not be competent to even sign the forms for the uh, consent and so forth. So it, it just does uh, rear its head everywhere in, in medical and legal practice. And elder law is, of course, an entire specialty that many of you are practicing. So the first slide is just dementia and modern legal practice. The second uh, slide eight we're on now is it's just our basic goals. Uh, I want at the end of this uh, for the participants to know just the basics of the different types of dementias there are, the spectrum of illnesses that there are. And again, it's something that that we see on a continuum. Someone may present to you very severe or very mild or very early stages. And so we have to appreciate that. And there are many different types. Um, and each type comes with a whole cluster of different symptoms. And of course, there are various treatments. There was a time when someone would say, yes, you have Alzheimer's or you have some other form of dementia. See you in the nursing home. There's nothing we can do. Uh, but now there are strategies that can help manage the disease, slow the progression, uh, possibly reverse some early findings. But of course, my area of research for the last, oh gosh, 10 years has been the preventative measures. What can we do to prevent the dementia from coming on to begin with? The whole idea of neuroprotection. What, I think that's the future of our field is instead of just waiting for a bad illness to happen, what can we do to actually prevent it from ever uh, being manifest, even in people who have a genetic vulnerability? So, of course, there are many medical risks that go along with uh, being aware of this condition, treating this condition, and there are legal risks. Um, there, there are risks to lawyers when someone presents to them with poor judgment, uh, poor insight, uh, and, and things that may be related to an illness rather than just a personality issue. Of course, they can be comorbid, and many times we see uh, in a, as a dementia progresses, what we would call an exaggeration of a pre-existing personality trait. So someone who is aggressive normally might become more violent, you know. So there's, that's something to, to just sort of a little pearl to file away. Well, we're going to talk about different legal scenarios and ethical scenarios. And I brought together at the end of this presentation some interesting cases that I've been a part of. And I want you guys to all be really equipped to to consult with someone who has dementia or uh, to consult with family members when there's um, a question of dementia or known dementia uh, going on in your client. So slide nine is um, it comes from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. You're all familiar with DSM. Um, and the DSM-5 um, 
was started was actually published in 2013. The first DSM goes back decades, and uh, after the 50s, we all decided as psychiatrists that it would be better to come to come together and, and know what our terms mean, so that when I call Dr. Jones and say I'm referring you a patient with borderline personality disorder, I'm referring you a patient with schizoaffective disorder, we would know what we were talking about. There were certain diagnostic criteria that had to be met. And it's it's actually kind of entertaining to read um, the very early DSM because you could actually, the very first DSM, you could actually diagnose someone as having a, quote, inadequate personality, unquote. Now, that describes many of the people many of us used to date, if you think about it, you know. But I thought, what a wonderful um, use of language that you could just simply say, well, I'm sorry, you have an inadequate personality. But at any rate, we're all the way up to DSM-5, and fortunately, that nasty diagnosis has disappeared. And and the word dementia has been subtracted out as well. The term neurocognitive disorder, as of 2013, replaces the term dementia. It's meant to clarify things. It's a little, to me, it's a little more confusing simply because uh, they break it down into major and mild neurocognitive disorder, and they break it down into subtypes. Now, among those subtypes, you can include things like delirium or drug intoxication delirium or mental status changes or drug withdrawal mental status changes or delirium. So they all fall under the same heading as the subtypes of dementia. So to me, it's a little more confusing. It was, it, I thought it was a little uh, clearer when we carved out the neurodegenerative illnesses. But of course, you know what Alzheimer's disease is. That accounts for at least 50% of um of the cases of dementia and maybe up to 70 percent depending on whose literature you read frontotemporal dementia frontotemporal lobar de- degeneration is now used instead of frontal lobe dementia um, so just to clarify the old term was frontal lobe dementia now it's frontotemporal lobar degeneration this is a form of dementia that's very worrisome it often occurs in younger folks but it's the frontal lobes are where we keep our uh, processing, our inhibitions, our morality, if you will. And these people uh, display just terrible judgment and terrible insight. And um, they may be socially inappropriate or sexually inappropriate, and yet their memory can be remarkably preserved. So that's a tricky one, and we'll talk about a case of that. And Lewy body dementia has gotten a lot of headlines uh, lately. It, the prevalence is more common than we thought. It's very akin and has some overlap with Parkinson's disease, so we'll talk about that. Vascular disease can um, be a form of uh, neurocognitive impairment and be a form of dementia as well. There have been in the literature um, many different labels for this. There was the old term multi-infarct dementia, and in the 80s it was actually called Benzwanger's disease. It's a very old term, uh, but it just was, you know, a lot of these doctors who were the first to describe something like to put their name on it. Um, And traumatic brain injury, and also a lot of popular press now, uh, you know, the people that have had repeated concussions, we've known for centuries, well, actually from, for decades, at least since the late 1800s, that, that dementia pugilistica existed, that boxers who sustained numerous head blows uh, would, have, um, would have a form of dementia. And if you read uh, the Hemingway and the Nick Adams stories, uh, Nick comes across a man called Ad Francis, who was a boxer. And uh, he was actually based on a real boxer, but this gentleman had um, this form of uh, what we now call chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, To clarify, we'll talk about that in some detail, but you need repeated concussive injury. Um, You don't always have to have post-concussive syndromes, uh, but again, repeated concussive injury or one severe injury can lead to um, some dementia related to traumatic brain injury. And, of course, you're all familiar with the controversies with the NFL and the new movie and so forth. Substance-induced uh, cognitive decline can occur. You can have people who have been addicted to alcohol or addicted to other compounds, and this will set their brain up for a form of dementia. HIV infection, there's a subset of patients with HIV who do develop HIV dementia, and it sort of mimics depression for a while, and then there's cognitive decline. The literature is a bit uh, confusing as to who's at risk for this and who's not, because there are many people, uh, of course, who live uh, very long lives with this infection and don't develop it, and other people who do develop it fairly early. Prion disease, the most commonly referred to one is, of course, mad cow disease. We've all heard of that, and that's a tricky um, bit of, uh, of, of discussion because it used to be thought only as a transmittable uh, piece of protein, like a protein strand that was infective, uh, 
but now we understand that it can be transmitted but can also be a genetic mutation. Parkinson's patients, patients with Parkinson's disease do indeed have a risk factor for developing dementia as the disease progresses. Huntington's is known to have a form of dementia. And of course, there can be um, other forms and there can be mixed forms. So a patient with alcoholic dementia can also develop Alzheimer's or a patient with, you know, uh, Lewy body can also have substance induced, you know, so that there is an overlap. In fact, uh, of the vascular dementia patients, those with the vascular form at autopsy, over 75% of them show similar pathology to Alzheimer's. So again, there's tremendous overlap. Uh, so the reason I throw that in is that it may not always be clear what we're dealing with um, with the patient because there's so much um, comorbidity and overlap between a lot of these, these symptoms. So slide 10 talks about the tremendous prevalence of this, uh, of all cases of dementia. Um, worldwide, going back six years ago, we could say safely there were about 36 million individuals who suffered from some form of dementia. Um, and, you know, if you think about just Americans with Alzheimer's, I think the exact figure right now is 5.4 million are thought to have Alzheimer's. Um, and uh, the vast majority are over age 65, 5.2 million are over age 65, but it can occur in younger folks, at least 200,000 are under age 65. We call that younger onset uh, type Alzheimer's. So the, the statistic that you may hear quoted is one in nine people over the age of 65 has Alzheimer's uh, type dementia. Um, and we expect, you know, as baby boomers uh, continue to live longer and so forth, we expect the, the rates to rise. Of course, the biggest risk factor is just getting older. The, the rates increase. Uh, with age. And the, uh, there are some people that their cause of death will be the progression of dementia, but usually something else uh, will cause the demise, such as a pneumonia or a stroke or something, before the dementia takes the life. So, And again, a, a big area of practice is nursing home medicine, nursing home psychiatry, and so forth. So there's no shortage. Sadly, there's no shortage of these cases. So slide 11 how do we make the diagnosis of dementia? I mean, first of all, what is dementia? Well, it's a cluster of symptoms that usually, usually starts uh, with, with memory issues, a cognitive decline, a general broad d d decline in functioning. Um, and as time progresses, then you see motor skills deteriorating, um, and you may see delusions, hallucinations, mood instability, um, and, and the person uh, can be just fully disoriented. I talked to a, a lady in the hospital this morning who knew her name, and she knew what city she was in, but she did not know where she was, what day it was, what year it was, did not know why she was here. So her dementia is certainly uh, very well progressed. Um, and there's another gentleman who's just kind of, he's, he's on our ward, and he actually went back to the nursing home today. We'd stabilized him for some violent behaviors. But he'd, um, you know, he could be oriented for periods of time to know where he was, what day it was. But, you know, when I went back 10 minutes later, he just, he didn't know that. He knew his name, and he knew he was in some type of facility, but couldn't name it and so forth. So, again, there can be a very variable presentation. But we make the diagnosis first by getting good history and talking to family members and so on when the patient can't give us a good history. And of course, our physical exam is good at just doing a good neurological exam to look for those signs of Parkinson's if they may or may not be there, but see if there's anything going on that might uh, tell you that this could be a reversible condition. And that's where our laboratory studies also uh, come in uh, because it could be a thyroid disorder or a B12 deficiency um, or there could be some metabolic derangement that, uh, that might uh, mimic a dementia. For example, the most common thing we do as psychiatrists to patients is give out antidepressants. And the most common uh, metabolic issue with antidepressants occurs in one in 200 patients taking antidepressants. And you may not have heard this before, but it's hyponatremia. There's something about Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Effexor, Pristique, Lexapro, Selexa, something about those agents that over time, one in 200 patients on those agents will have this gradual reduction in their sodium. Well, what happens when your sodium gets low? If it gets too low, you have a seizure. But when sodium gets very low, patients have confusion and they um, have mental status changes. And, they're, uh, and, and a lot of times, uh, you know, your lab results will tell you something that is very, very reversible. And that's, that's always just a, a dream come true when you think somebody might have a, a permanent decline and yet you can do something as simple as correct the thyroid or correct the sodium or correct the B12 level and suddenly they have a normal, normal functioning. The, um, 
The other things that uh, can show up, uh, such as normal pressure hydrocephalus, this is too much fluid on the, you know, the, your brain is basically making too much cerebrospinal fluid and not draining it properly, and so this is a, a triad we see with some falling down and some incontinence and confusion. That's sort of a very uh, classic triad, and that's where your MRI and CT scans come in. Uh, we want to get neuroimaging, a magnetic resonance Im imaging. Of course, the MRI is the superior one. That's the one we generally um, use. The CT scan or CAT scan, that's a good old-fashioned X-ray that's doing it in sort of a uh, uh, s slicing uh, mechanism whereby you can, you can basically take a, a, you know, a cross-sectional X-ray and you do this in series through the brain. Now, CT is very good for showing bony structure. It's not quite as good as the MRI as far as resolution. Of course, MRI does not use radiation, but it uses a magnetic field, and it relies on the fact that um, that most cells are filled with water and waters have hydrogen molecules and they are electrically charged and the magnetic field can be pulsed to align those uh, molecules and give a, and then released and then they recalibrate to wherever they were and as they do that they emit a radio frequency and people much smarter than me can write a computer program to take that data coming back and construct a picture based on those frequencies, and that's how we do MRIs. But MRI is very good at looking at the, the structure of the brain more than the bone, and it's very good at differentiating between the gray matter and the white matter and what's going on between the two. Gray matter, of course, is the outer layer of the brain where a lot of the thinking and processing goes on, as Hercule Poirot used to say, trust the little gray cells, whereas the white matter is, is deeper in the brain. It's more the subconscious activity and the autonomic functioning of the brain. And so we'll often see the findings of white matter disease and so forth in dementia, which we'll talk about. But in general, we prefer to get the MRI rather than the CT scan. Now, a PET scan is different altogether, and it's a wonderful tool, positron emission tomography. Now, this is where you tag, tag glucose with... Um, with something radioactive. And as you in infuse that into the patient, it's taken into the brain, and what it shows you is where metabolism is occurring. So it's not a measure of blood flow. It's not a measure of structure, really. It's a, it does give you a look at the structure. But what a PET scan is looking at is what cells are working and what cells are not. And so that you will see dark areas of lack of metabolism, lack of glucose utilization in parts of the brain that are, have too many dead cells or less functional cells. And one of the problems in Alzheimer's dementia for, us, for at least 50% of patients is they have difficulty uptaking and utilizing glucose. Uh, interestingly, insulin is not the mechanism whereby brain cells take up glucose like the rest of the body. So there's something impaired about the mechanism whereby they get energy in and use that energy. So the PET scan will tell you which areas of the brain are working and which are not. And I'll tell you a classic case of a, of a gentleman who had a head injury, and he had this persistent headache, and his temporal arteries had clamped off, and he had amnesia. He did not remember friends. He didn't remember hardly anything. His short-term memory was remarkably pretty darn good but his orientation and long-term memory was not, and we put him in the PET scanner, and sure enough, he had, his temporal lobes were dark. There was, um, we see this more in military victims of concussive injury where the vessels overreact and clamp off, but his marker was a persistent headache, and it showed on the PET scan that his temporal lobes were not metabolizing at all, very little, and that's where your memories are. That's why he could not process memories and remember things. So it was sort of an interesting one. Now, the, the important thing about a PET scan for Alzheimer's dementia is PET scan findings can show up three years before the patient starts having memory and cognitive difficulties. So it's almost, uh, if it weren't so darn expensive uh, at our facility, it's about five to $6,000 when you add in the radiologist fee for reading it. If it weren't so darn expensive and not always covered by insurance, uh, then we would use it as a screening mechanism for everybody because it will tell you three years in advance. You'll see PET scan changes on the temporal and parietal lobes before before you see the clinical symptoms, and that's what you see in Alzheimer's, temporal and parietal hypometabolism. Well, there are newer scans that check for the amyloprotein deposits, uh, the tau protein and so forth, and they tag them. I have, uh, ha we have availability to use them. I don't use them simply because it just tells me what I already know, and that's sort of the, the rule in medicine. If the scan's only gonna tell you what you already know, it doesn't change your therapy. Uh, I don't see the point in, in doing it. Um, 
and because that's not covered by insurance and it is very expensive. Now, neuropsychological testing, this can run the gamut, okay? You can do a bedside mini mental status exam, which is basically a 30-point scale and a few questions, and you ask the patient if they're, you ask about orientation, the day, the date, the time, so forth. Um, you ask them to repeat objects, to spell things, to spell things backward, to remember three objects, to do simple calculations, to write a sentence and do what it says, to read a sentence, and so forth. So this will give you a 30-point score. And if you're, tw hopefully all of us are getting a 29 or 30, we may get the date wrong once in a while, but overall we may forget the third object that somebody says to us 30 seconds ago, but overall, we're 29s or 30s if we're listening to this presentation. When you drop below 25, something is going on, and when you drop below 20, you certainly have a dementia. And if you're 19 or below, we don't allow you in a clinical research trial. So if you're 19 or below on that scale of 0 to 30, then my goodness, then you can't understand if I tell you that one of these pills may lower your blood pressure and one of these pills is a placebo. It's not going to do anything, but it looks like the other pill. We have determined that you can't understand that if you're 19 or below. Um, so there's also, that's the simplest one, but a lot of people have replaced that as their bedside battery, meaning something we do at the patient's bedside, with the MOCA or Minnesota um, Cognitive Assessment Scale, and it's, it's a pretty good one because it, um, it's, it's a little more detailed, it doesn't take that much longer to do, and it's a little more reliable. Um, and further, um, there are a couple of other easy tricks um, you can do that if you just have patients draw a clock, a clock face, and tell them to make it say what, five minutes after 12 or something, um, you will pick up a lot of dementia because the clock draw test will tell you about spatial neglect and, and how their parietal lobes are functioning and so forth. And it just tells you a great deal of things. So you may look up that. The clock draw test is a very quick and easy test for dementia. Of course, it's not foolproof. I mean, so it could be delirious or psychotic and not do a clock draw, but it helps. There's also animal testing and animal naming where I say, in the next minute, I want you to name all the animals you can. And you and I could say, well, you know, chicken, beaver, horse, cow, moose, you know, we, raccoon, possum, we could sit here. Now, you can't name different breeds of dogs. A dog is just one animal. But we could name animals for an entire minute just by thinking about the zoo or thinking about the farm and then thinking about the wildlife and so forth. But a dementia person simply will, will stop after, uh, we'll get to maybe seven animals at best if they have some severe dementia. So those are some very quick ones. But then there's the more, neuro, more fully neuropsychological battery that, that is done by our PhD psychologists. And they will come back with a, a maybe three hours of testing and they will give you a very detailed look at whether the patient's frontal lobes are working, their parietal lobes are working, whether they're, you know, what, what the specifics of their memory testing is showing and so forth. Now, many things do mimic dementia. Um, you know, and uh, as I mentioned briefly, you know, you can have a thyroid condition or a, a metabolic derangement or uh, liver failure or so forth that can be uh, dementia that could also be um, reversible when we treat it. Now, you may see something called pseudo-dementia in the literature, and this is a bit controversial because this is a term that comes from depression. When a patient is so depressed as to, as to appear demented, uh, and these are patients for whom we ask them questions and they just say, I don't know. And they don't even attempt. The patient with dementia, absent the depression, will say, you know, they'll try and answer the questions, but they can't. I'll say, what's 100 minus 7? And they'll say, ah, oh, gosh, 94. And then they, they struggle with it, you know. But the patient with, with pseudo-dementia or dementia that's mimicked by severe depression will say, I don't know, or I don't, don't care. I don't know. Leave me alone. You know, so they, the lack of attempt at the test is the hallmark of the pseudo-dementia. Um, and I'll tell you a funny story. We often ask patients to, who's the president? And then we say, well, who was president after that? And who was president before that? And, you know, I'm sorry, who was president before? You keep going back and see how far they can go. And most people live today can get back to Eisenhower without a lot of trouble, Truman and so forth. But um, we had one patient when I was a resident who was very entertaining because she went, she started with, um, I guess at that time, Clinton or Bush or something. But no, she started with Bush, I remember that. And then she went backwards and she skipped every Democrat all the way back to Washington. I thought, my goodness, that's entertaining. And the attending was a very uh, strong Republican. He said, there's nothing wrong with this lady. She's perfectly sane. So that was kind of clever that uh, she skipped every Democrat. Anyway, and she did it on purpose, by the way. Now, that takes a lot of cognition to be able to do that. I don't think I could do that. I think I would get a little fuzzy around that 1900 mark. So we'll go to slide um, 12, um, which of course is, is Alzheimer's. And of course, you know, this famous individual on the left, uh, speaking of presidents, um, was diagnosed with dementia of the Alzheimer's type. 
the, it is insidious. It can be gradual, and it is a progressive illness. And there's going to be impairment in at least two of these domains, memory, cognition, how we think about things, executive functioning, and eventually behavioral disturbances um, will, will come forward. Now, it doesn't have to be this way, but most people have short-term memory deficits first, and they will come in and they'll say, look, I mean, my wife will tell me something, and I, five minutes later, I'm, I don't remember it, and I'm having the same conversation, and she says, you've already told me that when we talked about it, or... Um, Fortunately for our patients and for all of us, the two most common reasons for memory, short-term memory deficits are stress and medication. And everybody I see, I'm seeing them because they have stress and I'm seeing them because there's medication in their system or there's about to be. So the reality is that most people who have memory concerns and awareness of it do not have dementia. It's a function of their stress and whatever's in their system. But over time that will progress and then you'll have the perceptual and motor ability changes language skills deteriorating and cognitive skills, social cognitive, social awareness uh, will decline so that somebody might uh, disrobe in public or lose, you know, more of the frontal lobe areas and so forth. But at least 80% have some comorbid psychiatric issues at some point in the illness. It's very rare. I remember one young lady, well, it wasn't young, actually, one older lady who had a dementia that just progressed with really the absence of, it was just a cognitive decline only. She didn't appear particularly depressed. She was pleasant. She didn't wander or get combative or have hallucinations. Or she got progressively mute and didn't speak. But that's rare. Most people are going to have some difficulties with behavior or delusional thinking or hallucinations. Um, and as time goes on, it can progress to just difficulty with walking and difficulty swallowing, and then there are risks for aspirations and pneumonias and pneumonitis and so forth. And of course, in severe cases, seizures can occur and incontinence can occur. But again, all this, the minority are occurring before age 65. And the majority are there between ages of 75 and 84, where we see the majority of patients. But as people age, the risk goes higher, and that's why 45% are above age 85. And by the time you diagnose that person, the mean time from the diagnosis of Alzheimer's to death is approximately 10 years. So slide um, 13, um, all, it just tells you more features. If you do an MRI scan, or a CT scan of a patient with Alzheimer's type dementia, you will see something called diffuse atrophy, and it does progress, and meaning there's a shrinkage of brain tissue. Now, there's a little bit of that that some radiologists will claim is normal, but we see it progressing, and we see it more severe than what they would claim within the normal range of acceptance. And you see hippocampal atrophy, and that's where your memory, uh, short-term memory, is going to be um, routed through. So it's no wonder that's uh, profoundly affected. And as I mentioned with the PET scan, temporal and parietal lobe hypometabolism, that can be predictive three years before the onset of the symptoms we mentioned. And on autopsy, they have these amyloid deposits and tangles and this tau protein. These are protein deposits and the, the neurons have tangles in them. Um, we like to say that these are not these are more the tombstones. That tells you the cell is already dead once you start seeing those types of uh, deposits. Now, some people do get this as an early age, and we have identified some of the some of the genetic risk. The amyloid precursor protein is abnormal. This is a normal protein, but it can be abnormally produced and deposited. And the genes also presenilin, pre right? You get the senile in there, presenilin one and presenilin two. But the more popular genetic risk you hear about is ApoE4, apolipoprotein E4. Now, yes, it's a risk factor for dementia, but it's not a. Not everybody who has it has dementia, so it's almost. Um, it's not always predictive. So when patients ask to be screened for it, we just have to be very cautious because it may scare them for no reason. Just having that. It's like having the genes for heart disease. It doesn't mean you're going to have a heart attack. You, you know, you could inherit that, but you eat right, you don't smoke, you know, you drink your two glasses of wine a day, and your heart is pretty healthy. I mean, so just having a genetic risk for something doesn't mean the uh, disease will manifest. But what's important about APOE to me is if you're APOE negative, you actually um, can respond very well to it to the ketone body treatments for dementia, which I'll go into when we talk about treatments. You know, so there is a it is to me more of a genetic marker, or the absence of a genetic marker, that can give you a treatment direction. Um, so slide 14. How do we treat? Alzheimer's. Well, um, Aricept is the brand name of Donepazil, and because we 
Um, this is a cholinesterase inhibitor, so it, it prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine. And where that comes in with this is that to store and retrieve memories, you, you use acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. And so the cleverness behind this is if we just prevent the breakdown of that acetylcholine, perhaps we can store and retrieve memories better. Now, it's self-limiting because you can't make more choline. The acetylcholine eventually has to be broken down, taken back in the cell, and use the choline again is used to make more of the neurotransmitter. So the data is not impressive. It, about a third of people get a little better and decline less rapidly on it, but most people don't notice much of a difference. Um, they, they've tried dosing it instead of 5 to 10 milligrams, they have to 20 milligrams a day, not a whole lot of difference. However, when you combine it, oh, there's also Exelon, uh, which is similar to Aricept. Uh, Rivastigmine is the, the generic of that. It's the same idea, acetylcholinesterase and butylcholinesterase inhibition. So it has another mechanism whereby you don't break down your acetylcholine. Some people think it's a little more effective. Well, the trick is they don't really work that great until you combine them with the next agent, Namenda. Now, Namenda or Mamantine works in a whole different mechanism. And as I mentioned, that over time with dementia, the cells actually die. What Namenda's claim to fame is, is the mechanism of that cell death is the membrane loses its integrity, calcium influxes, and you have calcification. You basically have like cement forming inside cells and Namenda will block those calcium channels so that there's no calcium influx even with the membrane deterioration. So for some reason, if, if you know, either one alone is not fantastic for the patient, but the two together, the Namenda Aricept or Namenda Exelon in combination, seems to have more protective value, more acute value for memory. So we tend to use those in Alzheimer's very commonly in combination. The problem with Exelon is the tremendous risk of nausea and GI upset, so we often uh, use it in a patch form. Serifolin is a, a product that's owned by Nestle now, and it's two things. It is high-dose uh, B12 and high-dose folate in the L-methylfolate form, so it's reduced B12 and folate and it's an antioxidant in acetylcysteine. So the thinking behind this product is the two mechanisms of cell death, before you even get to the calcium influx where the cells are calcifying, the first mechanism is a chemical called homocysteine. It's high and it's toxic, and the only way to lower that is with B vitamins. So if we give B12 and folate, that's the, those are the main B vitamins to help lower homocysteine. And antioxidants, of course, oxidative stress, is a for, it's basically just unpaired electrons or destructive to tissue. And as chemical reactions occur, these, uh, these electrons have to stick to something, and they stick to tissue and deteriorate it. So the best antioxidant across the blood-brain barrier is that uh, the amino acid in acetylcysteine. So this was a combination pill designed to see if you could, um, uh, you know, basically lower uh, the, the rate of cell death or have some neuroprotective strategy or improve memory strategy. We had a very small study uh, where we looked at PET scans before and after um, six months of treatment with this compound, and we did indeed show that some of the PET findings were ameliorated and even reversed in patients when we caught the disease early. When we caught it late, it didn't have much of an impact once the cells were already dead. But when we caught it early, we were able to show a reversal um, that was published as more of a case series uh, because the sponsor, the, the company's, uh, long story short, the company changed hands and the current grants were canceled, so we never completed the entire study, which is kind of a shame. As you know, pet studies are very expensive. Well, I mentioned Axona. Um, these are ketone bodies. Now, ketone bodies are naturally occurring compounds. They're made by the liver, actually, and the brain can use ketone bodies for energy. So even when you don't have glucose, it's, it's something that is very clever in that if you're starving and you're out in the wilderness, you've got nothing to eat, you're in the, wherever you're at and you're starving, your, your liver will make ketone bodies that, that your brain can utilize with 60 to 80% of the energy that they might get from glucose so that you can, your brain can still work even though you're getting no nutrients in for several days. So some clever researchers said, why don't we just put a series of ketone bodies together, give it in a milkshake form, let patients take that who have Alzheimer's and see if their memory improves. And indeed it does if they're APOE4 negative. So if they do not have that genetic marker, they actually do indeed show marked improvement with these. It's just a little hard for the patients to take uh, because it comes in a powder form. They have to mix it up in juice or water and take it in that form.
Well, the omega-3s or fish oils, there is a role now, and there's one product approved for cognitive decline and to improve cognition. It's called Viacog, V-A-Y-A-C-O-G. Uh, and it's uh, it, because omega-3s are important for the integrity of the membrane, uh, they're just good as, as protection. The early data suggests that it does improve memory to a point. Uh, nothing dramatic or huge, but it is a treatment option for us. And of course, when patients with these illnesses have depression and or psychosis, we simply have to treat that. But we're also mindful of a couple things that Drugs with anticholinergic side effects like hydroxyzine for anxiety or benztropine for stiffness in Parkinson's or even the antipsychotics, things that block the cholinergic system are notorious for causing short-term memory deficits and confusion if you get too much. So we have to be mindful that some of the drugs we use can make patients look more demented and make them certainly confused, and there can even be an anticholinergic delirium associated with that. And we know that the antipsychotics come with the black box warning by the FDA stating that they may increase the risk of vascular events so that somebody with dementia taking an antipsychotic is twice as likely as someone taking placebo to have a stroke or even to have pneumonia, believe it or not, on that antipsychotic. But we still use them. Even though there's the black box warning, we simply often have to treat the psychosis of dementia. So we're on to slide 15. Um, and vascular dementia, this is what uh, you'll often hear term multi-infarct dementia or subcortical dementia, but very common, second only to Alzheimer's type dementia. Uh, smokers are at higher risk um, and patients with diabetes or um, any sort of um, heart disease are at higher risk. And as I mentioned, 77% at autopsy have comorbid pathology for Alzheimer's, so that they, they technically would be mixed, both vascular and Alzheimer's types. Um, when you do the MRI scan, it shows small vessel ischemic disease, uh, patchy little strokes, uh, little strokes all over, really. Um, and, it's, uh, and, you know, these are not strokes bad enough that cause paralysis or the patient even notices them, or they may not have been associated with TIAs, but the accumulation over time has led to this pathology. I had a, a gentleman, a real nice gentleman, who came in with absolutely no appetite, and he had, was just could not smell food, couldn't eat food, had been losing weight. And he said, I don't know what I'm doing here. I've been to neurologist, GI specialist. They sent me to you. I don't know if it's psychiatric or what. We looked at his scan, and he had a stroke, a very small stroke, but precisely in the part of the thalamus where you'd expect his appetite center to be, and he just, that was the cause of this. I thought it was a very fascinating kind of lesson into the importance of where these ischemic diseases wind up. Um, and it's extremely variable. Um, some patients present with hallucinations as their first symptom. Some present with memory trouble. Some present, present with behavior problems. And what we often find is, is almost a sudden onset. Um, and the, the analogy is that they're patients with heart disease and their vessels are bad, but their heart is ticking along and they're doing fine and they don't know they have heart disease and all of a sudden they have a heart attack. Why is it that that vessel was 78% occluded and they didn't, they were living a normal life, but somehow 79% occlusion and boom, they have a heart attack? Well, often with a vascular dementia is the patient will have a sudden onset after a traumatic event like a head injury or a fall and break their hip and they go through surgery and they have a protracted hospital stay and suddenly they cognitively have declined. So their stressor on their system seemed to bring out a dementia that otherwise was just not going to manifest itself until that stressor on the system came on. And you'll hear frustration from patients. Look, they were fine before they came in the hospital. They'd fall down and break their hip. Now you're telling me they have dementia. What's that all about? It was a stressor on the system that brought out this vulnerability. And we often see, often see a stepwise decline in their, in their illness where they may be fine for, they plateau and do well for several weeks to months, maybe years, and they have a drop off and suddenly look terrible, may recover a little bit, but that's the new plateau. Whereas Alzheimer's more gradual, this is more of a stepwise decline. There's also something called vascular depression, and you'll meet patients who are more senior. They don't seem particularly demented, but they have this awful depression that just doesn't respond to antidepressants, and you do a scan, and it does show this subcortical uh, white matter disease and multiple little strokes. And again, based on where they are, it causes this sort of treatment-resistant, difficult-to-treat depression. Their psychosis, when they have it, may be very difficult to treat and may not respond very well to antipsychotics. And what do we do for these folks? Well, we give them the Alzheimer's agents, and we also treat them for good vascular health, things like Plavix, aspirin, things that lower the risk of future strokes. We also um, uh, 
give them the serifolin because lowering the homocysteine in the brain is good, giving them an antioxidant is good. The, the famous gentleman on the left is someone who's known to have uh, vascular, he passed away, he had uh, vascular dementia, heavy smoker, of course, and this was, and of course, a heavy drinker, uh, but this was Willem de Kooning. The, um, uh, he was really from um, the Netherlands, but he came to America and he immigrated uh, legally, um, and he um, was probably our greatest abstract expressionist. But as his disease progressed and he became de so demented that he could not recognize family members, they would put a brush in his hand and, and let him go to town. And the latter works are behind him where he just did those ribbons of floating color. And the jury is still out on whether this is, you know, the uh, great art where the subconscious of an artistic genius could still be um, displayed in this work even though he was cognitively disoriented. Or was it taking advantage of a demented old man because they sold for 300000 apiece and now go for 2 to $4 million at auction? I think that the best review of it I've ever read was Peter Schechtal, who writes uh, the reviews for The New Yorker on art. And he said that, you know, they're variable. Some are very good and some aren't. And, and that, to me, speaks to the variability of a demented patient. They can have good days and bad days. But I think it's also key to note that the impulses that drive the abstract expressionist are going to be subconscious. Again, this is a form of art where there is no story, or if there is, it is internal to the artist and maybe even not, e not even in their consciousness, uh, as opposed to a landscape painter or something where it either looks like it's what it's supposed to look like or not, or a writer where the, they, the words either make sense or they don't. Um, it's also um, worth mentioning there are patients who suffer from dementia but can still play music. Um, the patient I mentioned with the uh, temporal lobe dysfunction who could not remember family members but could, he could still play the guitar because that was learned memory going through the basal ganglia and not the temporal lobes. And you'll have demented patients who can still play the piano, learn memory going through uh, the temporal lobes, not uh, able to articulate what the song is, but they still know the song. So I think it's a fascinating discussion at what point uh, would an artistic, uh, the artistic expression of an abstract expressionist be lost? It's kind of hard to know. An unanswerable question. Of course, um, slide 16, we're talking about Lewy body dementia, which has gained some popularity thanks to, unfortunately, due to the death of Robin Williams, who was thought to be suffering from this. I think the three most um, famous, the three famous suicides in American history, of course, Hemingway, Marilyn Monroe, and of course now Robin Williams. Um, and of course, uh, Lewy body is named after the type of pathological bodies that you see under the microscope. They're protein deposits that you can see in the, that histological slide there. The PET scan, on PET scan, these patients look like they have Parkinson's, and they do have Parkinson-like symptoms, although it may not be symmetrical, okay? So I had a guy in my office yesterday, his right hand had a classic tremor, his left hand was fine. His gait was a little disturbed because his left leg wasn't great, but his right was kind of moving okay. So it's, it's not a symmetrical involvement of Parkinsonism, uh, but there's a tremendous overlap between Parkinson's and Lewy body. What's also fascinating about these patients is they have extremely vivid hallucinations. They can tell you in elaborate color and detail and so forth, and their delusions are also very elaborate. My favorite patient was a gentleman who saw people walking around in the uh, trees behind his house, living in the trees. He could tell you what they were wearing, what they were doing. It was very elaborate, and it wasn't much of a problem until he decided to get his shotgun and shoot them out of the trees, which is a good way to get your neighbors to commit you in a hurry. Uh, the person on call did not appreciate that he had Louis. We just didn't know he had Louis body dementia, so they gave him haloperidol. It's a potent D2 blocker and a psychotic, and the problem with that is that these patients get more psychotic, not less psychotic, with the potent D2 blockers like that. So it's a tough one to treat because they almost always have psychosis, and again, they're hard to treat. But it's, it's becoming more prominent. Then we have um, it's our ability to recognize it. Is, it's not more prominent. We're just better able to recognize it and describe it, I guess, is the way to frame that. Well, now we're at slide 17. Um, frontal temporal frontal lobes, basically, I use the old term here instead of frontotemporal dementia, but um, this is where we have our ethics and our judgment and our inhibition. And so the memory can be okay, and these patients often lack insight into the fact there's even anything wrong. Uh, I recently had a, well, not, it was some time ago, I had a, a, a gentleman come see me from another state, and his family insisted, and he, um, he was a minister, but he was becoming inappropriate. Uh, socially, sexually, his language tested out to have frontal 
type dementia, but denied to the hilt that there was anything wrong, that everybody else was just misunderstanding him. Uh, and he basically drove everybody away and, of course, lost one church and then he lost another. They wouldn't hire him back and so forth. But we treat this as if it is Alzheimer's type dementia. And these are the patients that not only did they decline rapidly, but these are the folks that you're going to wind up in your in your office and they're going to need guardianship and conservatorship because their judgment is just, just awful. And we'll talk about a case recently. On the PET scan here, I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of small on my screen, but you see the left is normal, all the different uh, lighting up of the brain. But on the right, you see where the frontal and temporal lobes are just dark. They're just not metabolizing. Um, there are other medical conditions that may mimic this. For example, our schizophrenics have a hypofrontality that makes them kind of look flat and depressed, decreased metabolism in the frontal lobes. But again, these, this is a very serious one. Sadly, the youngest patient I ever saw with this was 48, if you can imagine. Very, very tragic. Um, okay, well, um, slide 18. Um, there is alcohol-related dementias. Uh, you can um, have what looks like Alzheimer's, impaired executive functioning, difficulty with thinking, judgment, and me memory is usually okay for a while in some of these patients, but eventually it declines. And since it's not fair to put real people up there who are known alcoholics, I put Krusty the Clown, who's, an, who's a fictional character, who's a known alcoholic, has his own brand of vodka. Um, of course, you know the story of Mrs. Robinson and Dustin Hoffman here. Um, and with Anne Bancroft, you know, she wasn't that much older than him in, the, in real life, but uh, Mrs. Robinson was an alcoholic. And if you listen to the Simon and Garfunkel song about um, hide it in the pantry and, and stroll around the grounds, and uh, you know, it, it, it pretty much is a story about someone going into rehab. Um, but she's an alcoholic in that movie. And of course, the, the, the bottom right, you know, there is the, uh, the famous uh, uh, Dean Martin and, and Foster Brooks would do their alcoholic shtick. And of course, uh, Foster was a very, um, very convincing as the drunk and very good at it. Dean, I think if you look at the roasts and things in retrospect, you can tell when he was doing it as the shtick and you can tell when he, he did indeed, uh, was indeed impaired. There's a def very big difference. You don't have to be a professional to see that. But um, any rate, um, there is, uh, you may hear of Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. Now this is when the alcoholics get thiamine deficient and they have terrible short-term memory deficits. And so thiamine is usually a part of our detox protocols. When someone comes in for alcoholism, we almost always give thiamine. But it, and it's okay to give megadose. We found that if you just get the thiamine level, um, let's see, the, the, we, um, uh, to a normal level, uh, that it doesn't, um, uh, let's see, then it, it, it simply doesn't improve the memory. But you have to give it about five times the normal blood level before you get to um, the, uh, the, the um, improvement in memory. So um, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit so that we can get to some Q&A and be on time. And, and we're on slide 19 where we, we know about chronic traumatic encephalopathy because of the repeated head, head injuries. We have Tony Dorsett here who talks about his symptoms, how he has affective instability, anger outbursts, memory trouble, his daughters are afraid of him and so forth. Even with repeated mild head injury, you can see this. Um, and I wonder what the future holds for all these horrible, you know, events of the mixed martial arts people pounding each other. Um, you know, I wonder what the, their futures are going to be like. But at um, any rate, um, the first issues are trouble with memory, disorientation, dizziness, headaches, uh, and it just can progress to just this erratic behavior and poor judgment. And, you know, um, the, the latest celebrity, of course, uh, uh, Frank Gifford has said he wanted to improve uh, knowledge of that. It, and then on slide 20 talks about the further progressive dementia, the, muscle, the, the, the movement slowing like you see with Muhammad Ali who looks very Parkinsonian, uh, the impaired speech. Uh, and they can even have a little hyperness, hypomania despite that um, uh, and so forth. And some people do link suicidality to that. When you see dysarthria, it's trouble speaking, dysphagia, trouble swallowing, and eye abnormalities are also fairly common. But on autopsy, they look sort of like Alzheimer's patients where there are tau, you know, tau protein deposits. So now we'll break for a, a few, just a couple of questions and take a little bit of a break. Sorry about the, uh, the pace. I'll pick it up in a bit. Okay, and could all the attendees please type the passcode into the Q&A? Okay, the question is, who has the risk of liability when a dementia patient injures a caregiver when there have been repeated episodes of violent behavior? <laughs> 
Well, yes, you know, in, in a lot of times in the legal circles, it's a game of tag, you're it. And the last clinician <clears throat> who may have been made aware of that but did not address it might have some liability. Um, but at the same time, you know, the potential for violence and the acuteness of violence are, are addressed very differently. So um, when we get to the case discussions, I'm going to go into that exact uh, scenario. But that's a very tough one uh, because just the, um, you know, the commitment laws speak to acute dangerousness, not potential dangerousness. Uh, and the uh, clinician uh, in general does not use the antipsychotics or antiviolence measures until they see it. So it's a, t it's a tough one, tough one as far as liability. Okay, and what effects do Parkinson's drugs have on dementia? Right, the anti-Parkinson agents like, you know, the um, Requip and Cinemet and the Levodopa and M, M and you know, those generally are for movement disorders and the, the tremors and the, the gait and so forth. They don't help with cognition. The amantadine, um, it probably is neutral for cognition and, and uh, doesn't hurt it, but doesn't help it, and it, it um, may help movement. The co cogentin or benztropine will worsen memory deficits, not in a permanent way, but when someone's getting benztropine for their tremor, that's one where it has such a degree of anticholinergic burden that patients will indeed have short-term memory deficits while that's in their system. But there's nothing protective about the, um, the Parkinson agents. Okay, thank you so much. Please continue with the presentation. Great, great questions, and I will be a little quicker here. So slide 21, it just speaks to what I said about the fact there can often be an overlap. Many people with Alzheimer's also have vascular or chronic trauma. Just because you have CTE, like the football player, you can also have Alzheimer's as well. And Parkinson's and Lewy body are very tricky. So that's why it's very, very common, very common that we um, – go ahead and treat for Alzheimer's even when we think it's something else because the, the Alzheimer's medications are not going to hurt the patient with vascular dementia or Parkinson's dementia, but they may have a mixed component that may benefit the, at least part of it. So um, it's worth mentioning slide 23, the early onset of Alzheimer's can, can happen before age 65. It seems to be, though not a majority of cases, there's just a genetic risk for it. Um, and again, it can be extremely rare, but even in 30s, in your 30s and your 40s, it can can happen, and I think the saddest one I ever saw was age 48, I believe. Um, so Parkinson's, I mentioned, um, corticobasilar de degeneration. Um, these are this is a brain deterioration that's that's subcortical, meaning the gray matter where we're thinking and processing versus the the white matter where it's more subconscious automatic activity. That is becoming degenerative, and and that's in the realm that that's where you see the Parkinson's type or progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a form that's very similar to Parkinson's. And the way you can tell the PSP patients again is similar to Parkinson's, but they have two telltale signs. One is they fall down a lot. For some reason, these are older folks that come in and say, he's fallen down six times this week, and you do a eye exam, and they have paralysis of downward gaze and limited upward gaze. So you and I can look down and see our toes with our heads, with our chin straight up, and we can look up at the ceiling and kind of see that. They can't do that, and that's why they fall. They're always tripping, not seeing what they're, where they're falling. Um, Huntington's is, of course, known to have, be progressive and associated with dementia, uh, HIV I mentioned. Uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob is tricky. Um, prions, when I was in med school, we were told prions are infectious protein strands, and, and you, you've all heard of mad cow, and you, you get it from infected brains or infected tissue, infected central nervous system tissue, and that's why when we dissected cadavers, we had these special gloves when we dealt with the brain, you know, you couldn't have that, couldn't have that prion transmitted. We now understand it to be transmitted, but its origin is probably a mutation. So it's something from within that can also be transmitted, very spooky, right? So the way it was taught to me was it was sort of like a, um, a virus without the shell around it. And they have classic spindle formations on EEGs. They have a rapid decline. They're, they're very tricky to diagnose. Um, but again, the, 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 um, the ones that are often reversible are B12, thyroid abnormalities, normal pressure hydrocephalus, and certain autoimmune associated illnesses. Now, if somebody overdoses and they stop breathing for a while or they have suppressed respiration for a while, their brain can go with less than optimal oxygen or no oxygen for a period of time, and they can emerge from that with a dementia picture. And when we see those folks, we often take a very aggressive approach at trying to restore that memory. We give them the Namenda, Aricep, Serifolin, and treat them 
like a severe dementia to see if we can't recover that injury. Totally off-label experimental, but we're trying to preserve a brain after an overdose. Uh, there's a funky thing that can happen if you overdose on lithium and your lithium is toxic. And lithium across the blood-brain barrier, if you correct it too quickly, the lithium comes out too quickly. It pulls sodium with it, damages the cell membranes, and now you have a demyelination syndrome that can mimic depression. So there's a gentleman at, in a nearby practice that was uh, had overdosed on lithium, and he wasn't my patient, but uh, he suffered from this type, type of syndrome, and now he has a form of dementia. Um, some common and unusual symptoms, pseudobulbar affect gets some advertisements now because there is indeed a treatment for it, um, but it's, it's basically a pathological laughing and crying. These patients will have, um, because of their dementia or their stroke or whatever neurological condition it might have been, they have a disconnect between their um, expression of emotion and what they're feeling. So they may just cry at nothing, cry all the time, laugh inappropriately. I saw a lady in the hospital, and she just giggled. I said, what are you doing in the hospital? And she would just giggle and giggle and giggle. I said, well, are you sick? And she would giggle. And every time you questioned her, it was just inappropriate laughter. Um, uh, then it turns out she just didn't like my wardrobe. No, it was really true. She um, she really did have this pseudobulbar affect, but there is a treatment for that. There are a lot of delusions that just pop up very frequently. Foile a deux is um, tricky because that's when two people share the same delusion. And sometimes more senior patients will get paranoid and their spouse will confirm it. I had a, a, a nice lady come in who believed people were breaking into her house and stealing things out of her freezer and leaving the doors locked and showing no sign of entry. And she'd been calling law enforcement repeatedly and, and, and her husband was confirming it. Oh yeah, the stakes are missing. <laughs> it's like they both didn't realize what they had in their freezer. So when someone else is convincing the person of the delusion, it's harder to treat. And of course, all individual hallucinations can occur um, and altered level of consciousness we see with Lewy body patients sometimes you go in the room and you can't wake them up and sometimes they're a little hyper but they they may look like they've they're just obtunded and they're no on no medication so there's something about their uh, reticular activating system that's affected by this dementia whereby they lose their level of you know their, their ability to stay awake one of the more fun ones is, is uh, Bonnet syndrome these are patients who have lost a lot of their visual acuity and they will hallucinate now they're not demented but they will hallucinate and they specifically hallucinate because their vision is so bad there's just something going on with their nervous system and they often see little people like leprechauns or elves or gnomes they'll call them and they're fascinated to talk to so a lot of people would think they are demented when they are not. And my favorite, when I was a student, I had one of these patients who saw the leprechauns, and I was presenting the case to the attending, and the attending went over to him, this very famous psychiatrist, said, was it true what Dr. Farrer here says, that you're seeing leprechauns? And he went off and hauled the attending across the shoulder because he saw a leprechaun sitting on his shoulder at that moment. I thought it was kind of cute. And, of course, there's something called vascular depression. I think I mentioned that where... Uh, the, the strokes can accumulate and cause that. Um, I'll go briefly. Hospital-acquired cognitive decline. Patients who stay in the ICU for a prolonged period of time will get out of the hospital, and particularly if they've had a delirium and they've been given a lot of Haldol and Ativan to keep calm, they will have a, a cognitive decline looking like an early dementia, and it may last for months, and sometimes they don't recover that well from it. So this is something called hospital-acquired cognitive decline that's worth mentioning, and you can read that. Um, now, this is very important. What can we do to protect the brain going forward? Are there neuroprotective strategies? Well, of course, good antioxidants, homocysteine-lowering agents such as uh, the, the B vitamins, omega-3s. And when you take care of your heart, you also take care of your brain. So anything that improves vascular health, exercising the mind, there's new websites for that. Um, this also recommended that you play soft music through the night because it keeps your brain waves going as if there's stimulus, stimulation coming in even though you're asleep. And that's good. It keeps the brain working even though you're asleep. Um, so when people ask me what I can prescribe, there are some natural things you can actually do to protect the brain going forward. So 28, slide 28, yes, there's delirium risk with that. Um, patients who have dementia come in the hospital and as a function of that medical stress have mental status changes. They're ripped out of their environment. The days and nights get scrambled. There's a, you know, there's a, a IVs in them. They're in a bed. These are forms of restraint. There's alarms going off. The lighting, you know, is, is either on or off at night. They, you know, they hear the nurses outside. So the hospital issue is that patients with dementia are at very high risk for a delirium. It may be as simple as a urinary tract infection and now 
the demented patient is confused. Um, overtaking medications, I had one gentleman come to me and he couldn't figure out why he was sleepy all day and he was taking his Ambien in the morning. I'm like, nobody should take a sleeping pill first thing in the morning. Um, so misuse of medication. Of course, falls are a big liability for hospitals. Wandering behaviors, uh, many demented people wander off from their facilities. And of course, volatility and violence is of course an ongoing risk. So for your concerns, you're gonna meet patients who just have really bad judgment and you're going to meet people who have early dementia. And sometimes it's going to be very hard to tell the two apart. Um, you're going to have family struggles when there's money involved. It may not even be that much money, but families, you, you know, throw the money in there and the families uh, will act badly. Competency issues, um, you can have a competency hearing and you can determine legally. Competency is a legal term, but it's the one area of, of medicine where they defer to me. So I'll, we will have a demented person maybe refusing dialysis or refusing a, a necessary procedure. And I can do a consultation whereby I say, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, this person would not be found competent by a court based on the fact they may have such lack of judgment, such memory deficits. For example, somebody may not know why they're in the hospital. And so that psychiatric evaluation can substitute for a full, the understanding of a full competency evaluation. And you can subsequently go forward and do what you need to do. That has become the legal standard now. It's the one area where I can kind of stand in for the court and say, as a board certified psychiatrist, this person would or would not be determined competent. And because it would be lengthy, confusing, complicated, and almost impossible to drag them out of the hospital bed when they're in a life-threatening situation or a situation where they would have a demise and put them through that court process, we can say that in general you're, you're accepted to be incompetent at this point. Um, conservatorship, of course, when you look after somebody's assets and guardianship when you look after their person and sometimes their assets and so forth and POAs and, of course, a will. The legal threshold for a will, you guys know this, is very simple. All you have to know is what you got and who you want it to go to so that um, you can be completely delusional and think the Martians are coming to attack and see UFOs, but as long as you know you got $10,000 in the bank and you want your granddaughter to get it, there you've met generally the, the, the threshold for a will, but there are certainly other circumstances we can talk about. Um, and I'll go quickly, um, Emily, if it's okay, I'll just go quickly through the last few cases, if that's okay, uh, even though we're about out of time, is that okay, or do you want to jump to questions? Yes, you can just keep going, just to um, quick review the cases. Okay, great. So this was an interesting case. This was a self-made millionaire, one of my favorite patients. He was actually an OSS agent in World War II, a brilliant guy, and just fascinating. Um, and he basically um, had about $8 million in the bank. And at the time his children got involved and froze his assets, he only had his home. What he had done was he developed a frontal lobe dementia, and he became extremely vulnerable to every little charlatan and every little person who came by and um, there was a young lady who came by and you know decided to profess her love to him and think she was 28 or 29 and next thing you know he's signing over property to her sending her to real estate closings and she would get an entire building and some commercial property and so forth and of course he became paranoid towards his children and he was so good it's his, his the frontal lobe dementia was there but his IQ was so darn high and he was such a charmer and he was so his memory wasn't that bad that he was able to just fool people into thinking he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, and it was just a real tragedy because once this person took all this money, I mean, of course, they were gone. Um, but, of course, I was able to say that, you know, this gentleman does have a dementia, but unfortunately it was just simply too late uh, for him. But these are, this is the kind of vulnerability you see uh, for, for frontal lobe dementia with lack of judgment and insight. There was another case of a, of a lady who um, was – declining in the last two weeks of her life, her will was changed to give about her $2 million to a nephew that she had not seen in 20 years. Um, what was fortunate was she'd had a stroke and um, we had this documentation of many mental status exams where her numbers were, you know, when started at 16 and went down to 12. And so I was able to tell the judge that, look, at the time she signed over the will to this individual, she 
could not have been entered into a research study where she understood what a placebo pill was. She could have read the first paragraph of her will and 30 seconds later could not have repeated you one word of it or know what it said based on the many mental status exams. So that was able, that, that was fortunate in that they listened to, we had the documented many mental status exam to say that she really didn't understand what she was signing at that time. Uh, the next case was getting to one of the earlier questions. There was an individual who had dementia and really would not get care. I mean, they were hospitalized a couple of times, but about six months after the last health care encounter, um, they murdered their spouse. They were so paranoid that they thought the spouse was going to kill her, and she shot her husband, basically. Um, minimal engagement in healthcare, but they went to the very last um, psychiatrist who had seen this person and said, well, you should have checked for dangerousness and you should have done X, Y, and Z. And the guy says, look, you know, I made my recommendations. They didn't follow up. I didn't know there were guns in the house. You know, we certainly do have uh, um, a provision of somebody suicidal to remove guns from the house. But we, we don't really have that for dementia. That's not part of our guidelines for treatment of dementia. So it was a fascinating one where, they, where I mentioned the, the phrase tag your it. They just looked for the last health care provider, even though it was certainly remote, and said they should have had some responsibility. And, and I was helpful for the defense of that. So um, frontal lobe dementia, I mentioned the minister. There was another uh, professional who was very clever, um, and he... Um, just denied to the hilt that there was anything wrong. And I found this fascinating reference. It's, I've only seen this one time in a case. There's a form of, of visual agnosia where patients have um, a stroke of the occipital lobe usually, and they, they're blind, but they're in complete denial of their blindness. And they're fascinated. You'll be sitting there. With, I sat with this patient. She was completely blind. And I said, well, can you tell me what color shirt I'm wearing? And she said, oh, it's dark in here. I'm not, it's, not, it's hard for me to tell. Um, and, well, are you sure you can see me, you know? And, and she said, oh, yeah, I can see you just fine. So her, she would give excuses for what she could not see, but she adamantly denied. It was a fascinating syndrome, adamantly denied that she was even blind. And that's the kind of discussions you have with these people. They will just fight you that there may be something wrong going on. As a, as a practicing attorney, your best defense, if you think there's a question of somebody's competence, go ahead and order an evaluation. You know, if it's a neurologist or a psychiatrist or even some basic psychological testing, and simply document what you think is going on, that what may or may not be in their best interest. So if they're telling you they want to leave everything to this, their new girlfriend and all this, you know, whatever's going on, you know, what is in their best interest? And again, go ahead and start that discussion. And I've, I've, tell, I've t actually told a recent patient, I said, I've known you for like almost 10 years now. You're not yourself. This is not you. Uh, it's not you, like you to throw things at your wife and to behave this way. I know you don't think anything's going on, but I know you and this is not you. So it's in your best interest to go get the scan, prove me wrong. You know, and that was sort of my way of convincing him that what was in his best interest was to see, get this evaluation done. Um, these are the things that I mentioned that you could do uh, on slide 36 to keep that brain active. Slide 37, and we're finally back to, to questions. So um, sorry to be a little over time. Could all the attendees please type the passcode once again into the Q&A? We have about one question. One, we have time for one question. So what low-grade okay. symptoms would lead, lead you to look for a TBI after a concussive event with facial fractures from a car accident? Well, um, yeah, post-concussive syndrome is, is usually involves disequilibrium, trouble with balance. It involves a headache. It involves ringing in the ears sometimes, sometimes visual disturbances. More severe cases, when we may even see sleep attacks where people kind of conk out on you. Um, we see um, irritability, aggression. We see uh, nausea, vomiting. Um, but the main ones are going to be your headache, your short-term memory issues, sometimes irritability, light sensitivity, noise sensitivity um, are, the, are the classics. So in, in, and every patient is different. Every brain is different. Um, I think that you know, the, the, the vast majority of people who do have a head injury do have some degree of post-concussive symptoms, even if they don't meet the full criteria for post-concussive syndrome. Thank you so much. And we do have some additional questions, so if you don't mind, I'll email them over to you to get the answers to the attendees. Great. Okay. In, ad in addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for the past 60 years, TASL also offers e-discovery and forensic solutions, free interactive webinars, cybersecurity services, day-in-the-life videos, and research reports on expert witnesses, such as the Challenge History Report 2.0, the Professional Sanction Search, and the Expert Profile 360.
I want to take this opportunity to, to thank everyone for attending, and especially Dr. Farah for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Dr. Farah, or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case that you are working on, please contact TASA at 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you with regard to your feedback on today's presentation. Thank you so much for attending. This concludes our program for today.